I've always been really interested in women's health. I was a single mom of a young boy, and when he turned six, that's when I was able to start volunteering in the community around HIV. I had been a, a volunteer at the Speakers Bureau at AIDS Vancouver since 1986, and a group of women at the Speakers Bureau realized that women's issues were not really present in our trainings or in our discussions and meetings, and we found that a bit concerning. And then just coincidentally, in 1988, I attended a book reading of an anthology called AIDS, The Women. Long and short, a small group of us started meeting from the Speakers Bureau and realized we wanted to go for funding for a prevention project for women in Canada. We applied to Health Canada at the time and were successful, so we were the founding members of the first HIV and prevention project for women in Canada. But when I saw this ad for this job as Executive Director of the Positive Women's Network when I was still living in Seattle, I got pretty excited because it felt like coming full circle after having done the prevention work in the late 80s. And so it was 1993 and I came for an interview and two of the founding members, Evelyn Hildebrandt and Carolyn Hefner, were on my hiring committee and they gathered together with allies who were uninfected, including Jackie Haywood, who still works at Positive Living BC, to form the organization. Evelyn was a real down-to-earth woman. Uh, she was married. She was quite an activist. Um, she was very modest and very loving and had a very big heart. Carolyn had a small child. He was the first child, I believe, treated at Oak Tree Clinic with AZT after his birth, and he was negative. Uh, she was a passionate mother, but also a, a very quiet, thoughtful, introspective woman who did a lot of poetry, writing, and meditation. They both died uh, just before the advent of the new therapies, which has always broken my heart. One thing I always like to say is I don't believe there's any such thing as false hope. I think hope is a very powerful force in our lives. And um, it's the more that we can find it and hold on to it and, and nurture it, the more chance we have of creating a future for ourselves. In 1993, when I walked into Positive Women's Network and began there, it was this one tiny room, and there was three of us on staff at that point. One person was full-time, and yet those two who I joined and then Bronwyn joined quickly thereafter, it was very warm, and you know the focus was always the women come first. And that was one of the things that I loved, is that it was always this one-on-one -on -one emphasis that we need to honor people's lives and their experiences. While women are passionate about changing things for other women and supporting each other, they may not be able to do that publicly. And so we, as Positive Women's Network, are always bringing that to the table, that we mustn't forget who isn't seen. And just because people aren't seen doesn't mean their needs aren't important. I decided I was going to move to Vancouver. I was living in uh, Ottawa, Ontario at that time. And I saw this tiny little classified ad for an organization called Positive Women's Network. And so I had an interview and I thought, this is, this is it. This is what I want to be a part of. I was hired as a newsletter editor. And so this newsletter had been started handwritten I think about six months before I started, it was a handwritten and then photocopied and mailed out. Some were hand delivered and I have an interesting story. My partner who came to AIDS Vancouver a couple years after I started at uh, Positive Women's Network, she ran the support programs and she told me this one story about a woman who would phone her every month and say, Tracy, have you got my newsletter? And she would put out a Rubbermaid bin and a volunteer would go and put the newsletter in the Rubbermaid bin. I didn't know who she was, but I just know that that was her lifeline, was the information we were providing, and that that made a difference to her. Hearing that I'm supporting women is, was incredibly rewarding, incredibly rewarding, and it, it's very helpful, and affirming that all things matter. When I first started working at Positive Women's Network, I did a lot of hospital outreach. And I remember being called to go to the TB ward at VGH where a young woman who was 
incredibly sick with tuberculosis, was there dying. She was HIV positive, she had TB. And she was so gracious and thankful for the visit and for that human connection. And she's somebody who I still see today, 20 years later, she's a leader in the community, she's strong, she's a mentor to other HIV positive women. So it's just, that those, those are just such gifts to have doing the work. I was hired to develop a support program for positive women. At that time, there was also a women's program at AIDS Vancouver. So Beth Easton and Milo Riley were really, they were working really hard at trying to bring women's issues into the mainstream organizations. In those early days, working in a building that was um, predominantly f for and services by gay men, one of the challenges we found being in that shared space was it literally wasn't always a safe place for women. We worked really well professionally with our, you know, our, our colleagues at AIDS Vancouver and BCPWA. Um, but for some women, it really wasn't necessarily safe. It wasn't, wasn't okay to walk into a space where most of the posters were about um, gay men's sexual health. It was kind of, you know, not something that was comfortable for a lot of women. We also had situations where women were in our space in the back of that building and their abusive male partner would be standing in the grocery lineup at AIDS Vancouver and we'd have to escort her out the back because we were, you know, afraid for, literally for her safety. So we decided that we needed to move to a place that was maybe a safer women-only space. Something that really hit us really hard in this, I believe, I would say was around 1998, was when we started to learn in Vancouver about the missing women. All of a sudden, front page of the, of the papers, here are the missing women. And there's this, there's this page on, of all these faces of women, really throwaway women in our society. It's so devastating to us to look at, the, to look at these faces and recognize some of these women and then to have women come into our drop-in center and also look at these pictures and say, I, I, knew, I knew these women, I know these women, this is my street sister. The missing women really pointed, unfortunately, way too clearly the intersection of HIV and violence. Not all of the women necessarily were women who were HIV positive, but we know that all of those women, because of their lives, because of their own vulnerabilities were vulnerable and at risk for HIV. We see so many women that we work with who, are, who have dealt with a history of sexual violence, trauma, physical violence, emotional violence, which puts them more and more, more at risk for HIV. Such a tragic and horrible part of our collective history, what happened to those women. People were dying very quickly in those days. Women were dying very quickly. And we began to see that. And so early on, uh, I brought in a, a woman to do some grief work with our team. And one of the things that we were committed to was talking about what it's like to lose women who we've become close with and had relationships with. The loss has just become cumulative. And if you just press them down and push them aside, you can't do your work well. You burn out. And I've seen that in a lot of organizations, a lot of churches over. And I am proud to say that we have a, a real history of longevity with our staff team. I think for a lot of reasons, but I think one of the foundational pieces is that we have addressed what the experience is and what HIV means in terms of your heart and your soul. I'm celebrating my 20th anniversary at PWN uh, next month, and I was reflecting about that and how I've been able to stay at an organization that has lots of challenges and lots of stressors for so long. And I think not only the members inspire me every day, and I learn so much from women living with HIV, but the wonderful staff I work with. Our staff team is exceptional, a dream team as I call them, and they care so much. There's so much passion at our agency.
and then combine that with the aid service organization community and I just feel a part of something very important. It's, it's very moving. It's really incredible to think that, you know, the majority of my professional life I've worked in the women in HIV movement and being really, really fortunate to work with a group of women who are passionate, committed, and really, really smart. And it's, you know, Janet has been, we joke about that Janet's my work wife. And Marcy, as a leader, as the executive director, is such a mentor and has really worked so hard at bringing the voice of women, not just locally, but nationally. I've been greatly privileged to do this work and have the people share with me changes in their lives and moments and babies and deaths and achievements. I've been witness to the most intimate pieces of people's lives and I feel very privileged and grateful for that. I can't describe a woman with HIV. A woman with HIV could be anybody.